All right, good morning to my friends who are joining us for, via recording for today's session. It is April 9th, and we are talking about uh, the lab packet related to the sheep brain and the cranial nerves and the arm. So we're going to dive right in. Uh, want to mention that we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the ventricles, the fluid-filled spaces in the brain. This is a model that specifically shows us the meninges of the brain, which is the connective tissue layers that are around the brain. We labeled everything on this model last week, except for one new structure that we see uh, highlighted and listed for us here for things we need to know. That one structure that's new for us that we need to know is called arachnoid granulations. So the arachnoid granulations, I'll mark for us here on our, our model, the arachnoid granulations are these little bubbles right here that we see on the model. We can tell it's the bubbles for a couple of reasons. The first reason is when you look at it, see how the color of it matches this, this color right here. So it's that seafoam green color that I see right here. These little bubbles are places where the arachnoid mater, the middle meningeal layer, bulges out. Does anyone remember from their working on the lab packet um, what happens at these little bulging places here? What's going on right here in an arachnid granulation? Does anyone know yet what these things do? I'm making you type. Or we might not know. Yeah, so it has to do with, with, with what's going on with our cerebrospinal fluid. So remember from last week and, and from lecture actually this week, we talked about how there's cerebrospinal fluid that surrounds the brain in this space right here. So this space right here that's found underneath the arachnoid mater is called the subarachnoid space filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Your brain is constantly making cerebrospinal fluid, which means I constantly need to be getting rid of it as well. These little bubbles are actually really leaky. So these leaky bubbles spit out or they release the extra cerebrospinal fluid once it's circulated around the brain. They release it into this big blood vessel up here called the dural venous sinus which is a blood vessel in the middle of the parts of my connective tissue layer called the dura mater. So um, as a couple of us said in the chat, this is how I take that cerebrospinal fluid and I, I get it away from the brain. So I leak it back into the bloodstream. This essentially, the way we talked about it in lecture, remember we kind of talked about how with, with the fluid we have this circle of life thing going on here. So uh, when we talk about cerebrospinal fluid, it starts, the beginning of the circle of life is when it's plasma, when it's the fluid inside blood vessels. Let's do a lecture review here. What's the name of the specific type of blood vessels that leak plasma to help us make cerebrospinal fluid? Which kind of blood vessels in the brain do I use to make CSF? Yeah, it's those ones called the choroid plexus. Choroid plexus. Okay, so the choroid plexus leaks out plasma, leaks out that fluid. When that fluid gets either into the ventricles, the big fluid-filled spaces, or when it gets into the subarachnoid space, which is what we're looking at right now, then I call it cerebrospinal fluid. Because I'm constantly making cerebrospinal fluid, though, I need to constantly dump it as well. So that cerebrospinal fluid goes through the little structures we're talking about right now called the arachnoid granulations. When it drains out of those arachnoid granulations, it turns back into plasma because it's back inside a blood vessel. So when it's inside the subarachnoid space, it's cerebrospinal fluid. I dump it out this little escape hatch right here into the dural venous sinus, and now I call it plasma again. So the circle of life on our fluid, just remember I need these structures right here, the arachnoid granulations. Otherwise, I have too much cerebrospinal fluid. And what's the name of the medical condition when I have too much cerebrospinal fluid surrounding my brain? What do I call that medical condition with, with too much CSF? 
Yes, several of us are chiming in here. If there's too much cerebrospinal fluid, if we're not leaking it enough, I call it hydrocephalus. So uh, just a quick reminder for us, these arachnoid granulations, their job is to spit out that cerebrospinal fluid. Do make sure, what I, what I always tell students in class, this model came up two weeks in a row, which is a wink, wink, nudge, nudge for you that you will see this model on the exam. So make sure we know the meninges, make sure we know the arachnoid granulations, make sure we know the spaces in between there. Um, the, the, the first thing when we're going through the packet that you guys mentioned you wanted to work on was identifying cranial nerves. So let me pull up our cranial nerves picture here. Okay, so we are looking at a picture of one of our brain models that, that has the cranial nerves. Um, just for my reference, give me, uh, raise your hand for me. So underneath the screen, there's a little raise your hand space. Raise your hand for me if um, Roman numerals, which is all these guys right here, if this is new to you, if you're not really familiar with Roman numerals, can you raise your hand for me if, if you didn't really do these in school? How many of us are like that? Yeah, so I've got a few people that are that are, are chiming in on this. Yeah, um, so the, these are what we call Roman numerals. Um, what I will tell you is, is since we are taking our exam um, on the computer as opposed to on paper, we are going to have to make sure that we can recognize these Roman numerals. Um, so just start kind of making in your mind and start writing on your paper for yourself. Um, what these numbers represent. So we're we're in numerical order. The good news is we didn't I didn't go tricky with you on here, and we didn't go tricky with you on um, on page four of your lab packet either. It is in order. So uh, a single I is the letter or the number one. Then we got number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'll number them all here for us. If you want to, you are welcome to look up how Roman numerals work. I don't think that you or I have enough time right now to be wasting on our, our mind on learning how to do Roman numerals, right? So um, the best thing I would say is just memorize them, um, what, what they stand for. What we will try to do on the exam is to give you um, the Roman numeral and either give you the name of the nerve that goes with that Roman numeral or try to give you the function of the nerve to help you remember. So uh, Roman numerals, as we see on our list here, this is the way that technically, because anatomists are mean, they technically name uh, these nerves with, with Roman numerals. When we look at the cranial nerves, a good note for you to make for yourself when you're figuring out um, who's who when we're looking at a brain model, we always start from the anterior part of the brain from the front part of the brain, and we work our way posterior. We work our way back. Um, we always start in the middle. If I've got a bunch of nerves that are, are together, I'll start toward the middle, and then I'll work my way outside. So I go from medial to lateral. I go from anterior to posterior. So that's gonna help us out with our labeling because we're just counting from the front to the back and from the middle to the outside. So let me get my pencil here. The first cranial nerve, I hope we can all find it on our model here. The first cranial nerve are these big white things right here. These ones should be one of the most recognizable cranial nerves when we look at a brain. Uh, this is called the olfactory nerve. Uh, cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve. So I'll, I'll put it over here next to it, olfactory. Hey, we've, we've talked about that word olfactory in lecture a little bit recently. What does olfactory mean? What does this nerve do for you? Yeah, olfactory means smell. So, so cranial nerve number one, my olfactory nerve, this is the nerve that helps you to smell. This one is always the one that's the very closest to the front of the brain. So you will always see these two big long lines that I see up here at the front of the brain for cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve. Um, Jocelyn, I see your hand raised. I don't know if it's from earlier or if it's new. Um, if you have a question you want to speak out, go for it, or you can type it into the chat for me, and I will will definitely look at it uh, for you. 
uh, we got cranial nerve number one. Next cranial nerve is number two. Now here's what I want you to do on your picture. Here's the part that actually shows me cranial nerve number two. I've got two little parts right here that show them to me. What I want you to do is I want you to make a little line that goes like this and a little line that goes like this, attach those two places. Cranial nerve number two is the optic nerve. I guess I probably should do Roman numeral, shouldn't I? Optic nerve. Cranial nerve number two is the optic nerve. The way that you're going to see it on most of the models and the pictures that we're going to use is you're going to see this little crisscross pattern right here. So this little crisscross pattern right here is something that's called the optic chiasm. The optic chiasm. Uh, th this word chiasm right here means that it's an X or it's crisscross. So when I'm looking at the optic nerves, I see a big crisscross, a big X pattern right here. Or you're at least going to see a place where these two sides meet. I think on our sheet brain pictures, we might not quite have the full X. We might just kind of have a V. Uh, but cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve, usually we're going to see this big X, this big crisscross right here. That's called the optic chiasm. Who can help me out here? Cranial nerve number two helps you to do what? What's the job of cranial nerve number two? The optic nerve. Yes, this is my seeing nerve, or this is my vision nerve. Um, by the way, here's a reminder for us. Remember in the body that we had two things called general senses, and we had things called special senses. So far, I've talked about the sense of smell and the sense of vision. When I talk about smell, is that a general sense or a special sense? The sense of smell. Sense of smell. General sense or special sense? What do we think? Ooh, I was tricky with you guys. I guess we didn't talk about this one enough. The sense of smell is actually a special sense. Sense of smell is, is one of our special senses, along with the sense of vision, which is our, oh, you're good, Pauline. I didn't talk about it. Honestly, we didn't talk about smell a lot during during lecture. So, um, yeah, the sense of smell is a, is a special sense. The sense of vision is a special sense. Um, we are going to talk about, let me jump ahead of myself just a little bit, cranial nerve number eight down here called the vestibulocochlear nerve. Can you jump ahead in your notes and help me out? Tell me what the vestibulocochlear nerve does. What's the job of the vestibulocochlear nerve? Yeah, it has, has two jobs, like Kathleen chimed in for us. Uh, its two jobs are hearing and balance. Hearing and balance are actually both also special senses. Hearing, equilibrium, that's the fancy word for balance. And there's one more that's missing from my list here. Does anyone happen to remember the one more that's missing from my list? What's the other special sense? Does anyone know? Yeah, special sense of taste. Technical word, gustation. Special sense of taste. The reason I point this out is to say that cranial nerve number one Cranial nerve number two and cranial nerve number eight. These three nerves right here, they are only involved in special senses. They only collect special sensory information. So cranial nerve number one helps you with the process of smelling. Cranial nerve number two helps you with the process of seeing. Um, Kathleen, yes, number nine does help with taste, but that's not the only thing it does which is why I'm not including it in our list here of nerves that just do special senses. Um, so, so Kathleen's absolutely right. Glossopharyngeal down here helps us out with the sense of taste. Um, so technically we, we could add this one to our list as well. It does help with taste, um, but it's, it does both taste sensations and it has some motor activity. Um, so that's why I didn't include it in our, our little list here. But yeah, that's a good point. That's another one that, that helps us with special senses. So we have found number one and number two so far. We are working our way from front to back. 
So as we work our way from front to back, the next nerve we bump into is this little line right here. So these two little lines that I see right here, these are cranial nerve number three. So you can see one on each side right here, cranial nerve number three. Cranial nerve number three is called the oculomotor nerve. Oculomotor. Hey, this oculo part right here is like the oculars on your microscope, or it's like the ocular region of your body. What do we think oculo means? What might oculo mean? Yeah, well, so it doesn't have to do with sight directly. It does have to do with eyes. Um, so the oculo part specifically means eyes. The reason I say it's not having to do with sight is check out the second half of its name. Motor. Oculomotor. That's cranial nerve number three. It means eyes movement. So, yeah, as Isla said, moves the eye. So the oculomotor nerve, based on its name, I know that it's an eyeball mover, oculomotor. Hey, cranial nerve number four, which is this little one that I see here on the side, um, and I can kind of see it a little bit right here as well. Here, let me zoom in for you. We'll make it a little bit bigger. Cranial nerve number four is right here and right here. Cranial nerve number four is called the trochlear nerve the trochlear nerve over here, and cranial nerve number four works together with the oculomotor nerve to help you move your eyeball. So to help us learning our, our things in groups here, we got one, oops, trying to mark here. We got this one that moves the eyeball, uh, cranial nerve number three. We've got the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve number four that moves the eyeball. And I'm gonna skip one here and go down to number six because number six, the abducens nerve, also moves the eyeball. When you're trying to study uh, this material, when you're learning the cranial nerves and their functions, the, honestly, the best way, or one of the most important things to do is to find ways you can group them together. So that's why we said number one, number two, and number eight, they all do special senses. Here's our next group. Number three, number four, number six. All of those cranial nerves are involved in moving the eyeball. The oculomotor nerve, which we found right here. The trochlear nerve, which lives next door to it on the sides. And we'll skip down here. Here's number six down here. The abducens nerve, number six right here. So let me mark that one too. Three, four, and six eyeball movers. We want to make sure we know those. I probably don't have space. I'll just put its name down here. Abducens. We skipped number five. Uh, number five is another one. I'll show you what you can see on my model right here is this big circle. And I can see this big circle right here as well. But here's what I want you to do, kind of how we, we drew stuff on number two. We're gonna draw stuff on, on number five as well. So I'm gonna take my pencil here. What I want you to do is coming off of one of those big circles that you see there, I want you to draw a line and then I want you to put one, two, and three branches coming off of it. We can do the same thing on the other side if you want to do it on both, on both sides here. One, two, and three branches coming off of it. This is cranial nerve number five, the trigeminal nerve. When I talk about the trigeminal nerve, the way it got its name, trigeminal, that literally means three branches. So this is why we drew our little stick here with three branches coming off of it. The trigeminal nerve is a nerve that's really important uh, for going to your face. So if we were in class together, I would have you guys all flash up three on the side and then take that number three and put it started at the base of your jaw and put it next to your face. So if you guys can kind of see what I'm doing here. I've got one that's going down here along my jawbone one that's going more in the middle, and one that's that's going up toward the top of my face. The trigeminal nerve collects sensory information from all of these places on your face. So you can, can feel where the branches go by, by putting up your number three. Um, so that number three, these are my three branches that go to different places in, in the face. 
uh, but the trigeminal nerve really goes goes to the face to help with sensation from there. So cranial nerve number five, remember we always start at the front and work our way back. So we had one at the very front, two that we added our X for, number three down in the middle in the front, then we go to the side with number four. Hey, a note you could make for yourself is that number four is the smallest cranial nerve. The trochlear nerve It's the smallest one. It's right next door to number five, which is actually the biggest one, the trigeminal nerve. And then remember, we go back to the middle. We got number six here in the middle, the abducens nerve. So next door to the abducens nerve, number six, number seven and eight are actually grouped together. So it's a little bit tough for us to see the difference between seven and eight. The way I'm going to label it is I'm going to go from one side. The one that's more medial is number seven. The one that's more lateral is number eight. So my medial nerve is cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve. My lateral nerve is number eight, the vestibulocochlear nerve. Vestibular cochlear nerve. So number six in the middle. Next to it is number seven. And on the very outside is number eight. Now things get a little bit funky. So we're going to uh, go down. So notice how I'm moving my way down. We are now uh, into the part of, of the brain stem called the medulla oblongata. Let's see if anyone can, can answer this for me. Right now, all of these cranial nerves that we're looking at up here, all of these cranial nerves were attached to the part of the brain stem that its name means the bridge. Which part of the brain stem was right here? What's this part here? Yeah, a couple of us are, are chiming in. This is the big bump called the pons. A lot of my cranial nerves, so number three all the way through number eight, are all attached to the pons. There's a lot of cranial nerves here. When we start going down onto the medulla oblongata, that's the part down below it, our, our numbering system and our pattern gets a little bit funky. So for us to find cranial nerves number nine and 10, we actually have to go to the lateral side of the medulla oblongata instead of the medial side. Normally we start in the middle. Well, number nine and 10, they're funky on us. We don't start in the middle. So number nine, see, I can get a little bit closer, okay. Cranial nerve number nine is this top, oh, this top little group right here. Some of those branches, kind of the top half of the branches. That's number nine, number nine, glossopharyngeal. Glossopharyngeal. The lower half of those nerves that I kind of cut off a little bit, that's number 10. Number 10 called the vagus nerve. Oh, I, wait a minute. Yes, we're good. Sorry. I, yep. Okay. So cranial nerve number nine, top half. Below it, cranial nerve number 10. I'm going to be totally honest with you guys. When you are working on the homework assignment, and when you're working on the exam, the best way to tell, am I asking you about number nine or number 10, is going to be the direction of the arrows. So if I am pointing down from the top, that's going to be a number nine. If I am pointing up from the bottom, that's going to be a number 10. Um, so nine and 10 are really close together, just like seven and eight were really close together. Pay attention as to which direction I'm, I'm pointing at or where it looks like I'm coming from. So am I, am I coming medial or am I coming lateral? That tells you if we're doing seven or eight. Is it top or bottom to tell us the difference between nine and ten? We go down a little bit lower then. This whole big bunch down here, this big bunch of little uh, little roots that are coming off of the, the spinal cord, this is called the accessory nerve, number 11, the accessory nerve. When I talk about the accessory nerve, here's as close to controversy as, as we get in anatomy. 
Um, when I talk about the accessory nerve, some scientists say we probably shouldn't call this a cranial nerve because it actually is attached to the spinal cord, technically. By the time we get down here to the accessory nerve, we're in the spinal cord. Um, but our textbooks haven't caught up with that controversy yet, so we're still calling this a spinal nerve right here. So the accessory nerve is actually the lowest cranial nerve you'll see when we're looking at our model. All the way down here, lots of little branches here with the accessory nerve. Our last cranial nerve is number 12. And to find number 12, we actually have to go back up to the medulla oblongata. So see this little group of roots that's right here on the medulla? I can see it on this side as well, here on the medulla. Cranial nerve number 12 is actually in the middle. So let's circle it right here. Cranial nerve number 12. And I can see it here as well. I'll do an arrow. Both of those are cranial nerve number 12. Number 12 is called, let me slide over, the hypoglossal nerve. Hypoglossal nerve. Now, bear with me. I'm going to do a quick Google search here. I know you have some really good colored pictures. Oh, here we go. Let's see if I can blow this one up big. I know you guys have some good colored pictures in the, um, the guided lesson for this week. Let me switch to sharing my screen with you because I think I found one of them that you have in that guided lesson. Let's share a window right here. Okay. Ooh. I'm pretty sure you guys have this picture in the guided lessons this week. And this is a great study picture for you. Let me click and see what happens. Perfect. Okay. Because they have each of the cranial nerves shown in a different color. So we have the olfactory nerve, number one, here in the front. Back behind it is the optic nerve. Now, what, what you're seeing right here is the X part that we drew. So they got rid of where this attaches down here at the bottom, but I've got my optic nerve right here. And then we talked about cranial nerve number three, the oculomotor, that's right behind it. Then we've got this small little number four that I see next to it. My chat's blowing up. Let me make sure we're not dying here. You're going to print that out. Okay. Good, it's it's good diagram. Okay, <laughs> I was afraid that I was getting a bunch of chats. Like, I can't see that. Can you help me out? So um, I, I think it's in the labeled images PowerPoint. Uh, or not labeled it. Well, it's probably in labeled images too, actually. But I think it's in the guided lesson. Um, if it isn't, I literally just did a Google search for cranial nerves. And it was like the third hit. Um, so you should be able to find it. So we've got number one. Go down to number two that we made our little X with. Number three is the first one that we had on the pawns that's next to it. And then its small little next door neighbor is number four, the trochlear nerve. Remember, we drew our big branches for the trigeminal nerve that I see here on both sides. That's the biggest one in the body. Then we go down to the middle where I see the abducens nerve middle. Remember that the facial nerve and the vestibulococular nerve, seven and eight, they were right next to each other. Uh, and then we've got 9 and 10. We can see those 9 and 10 over here that are right next to each other as well. Number 11, the one that's down the lowest, and then back in the middle for number 12. So if there's not a good picture, if you don't like the ones that are in the guided lesson, please feel free to go to Google Images. Or please feel free to go to the labeled images PowerPoint for the week. Um, most of the pictures that you have in the guided lesson come from the labeled images, but if this one's not there, in your guided lessons. Like I said, I did a Google search here. Let me switch screens that I'm I'm sharing with you here. Let's switch to oops. Let's see, I'll stop sharing and I'll share the other tab just to show you how easy it is to find it. Oh, it was literally the the, the first hit. So I did a Google search for cranial nerves, and the first hit on, on that search is is this right here. So um use that as, as a study tool for you um, or whatever other helpful. Let's see, this one looks like it might be helpful too. It's a little small, uh, but yeah, feel free to go through these pictures here and find something that helps you to identify them. All right, let me go back. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint and then I'm going to look at our questions again here. Let's see. 
So it erased all my labeling. Now it looks a little bit less scary maybe because it's not quite so, so crazy and messed up here. Uh, let me look at questions. Yeah, hopefully it is much better having them color coded. Um, absolutely. Definitely think about printing it out, um, especially printing it out in color if you can. Um, on the lab exam, will you use this or will you use the other picture? Um, that's a good question. I don't have an answer for sure on it. Um, let me, I'm going to pull up and, and check something really fast. On the guided lesson, let me see. I think, did we only give you pictures? Oh, that's way too far. Okay, um, so I'm looking at the guided lesson, um, and it looks like we gave you pictures that, that probably came from Google. Um, my guess would be that we will probably use uh, a picture like that um, since we haven't had a chance to look at those models in class together. Um, I am going to meet with some faculty today about the exam. Um, if I hear otherwise, I will let you know. Um, so assume that we are going to give you something that it's as clear as possible on. Um, that being said, there are some cranial nerves that are really clear on this picture. Number one, you absolutely can see, no questions asked. Uh, number three, we absolutely can see super well. I can see the locations of number four and five really well. I can see number six. For some of these little ones, like seven and eight, uh, nine and 10, those are a little bit harder. So I may not ask you on this model. I might use a different picture. Uh, but then again, down here with 11 and 12, I can definitely clearly see both of those as well. So yeah, practice on, on this, definitely. Use the resources you need to to help you learn. Um, but but we will, if I'm going to ask you about 9 and 10, if I'm going to ask you about 7 8, I'm going to find you the best possible way to see them. Um, that's going to be the goal. So do practice both ways. Practice um, on um, on those those pictures that look really great and see if you can use that to apply it to, to our pictures of the models. Hey, so let me do something uh, to help you guys out with functions of the cranial nerves. I know that um, nobody specifically asked about this, but if we were in class together, I would try to make time to do this with you. So um, find yourself either a blank piece of paper or somewhere where you have some extra space. We are gonna use a clown face to help us memorize some of the functions of the cranial nerves. Um, let me do myself a quick favor here and remind myself of what my clown looks like before I start drawing him for you. Um, I should have done this before class today, right? So let's see. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Six, eight. Sorry, guys. Dr. Ollis came not quite prepared today. Uh, Vegas is 10, 11, 12. Okay, here we go. We are going to do a, a we're going to use a clown face to help us memorize our cranial nerves. So to start, we're going to draw ourselves a circle for the clown's head. Here's my clown head circle. And it's going to be a creepy clown, but hopefully he's a clown that helps us to learn here. So uh, in the places where you're going to make the eyes on your clown, let's go ahead and put number twos. We're going to give him a nose. That's number one. And we're going to start there. So we're making ourselves, I guess the other thing that you can do really fast for yourself is our clown has a bow tie. So go ahead and give him a bow tie. And inside that bow tie, let's write for ourselves uh, number 11. Number 11. Uh, Eileen says she can't see anything. Um, is that true of everybody or is that just Eileen? Carrie can. Okay, so for those of you that cannot see anything, go ahead and try to refresh your window. Uh, maybe your, your window is not happy with, um, with what I did. So just go ahead and do a quick refresh. It'll let you back into the classroom. Hopefully then you can see it because a lot of us can. Um, some of us can't see everything, so go ahead and refresh your window and see if that helps. 
Uh, so what we're going to do with our clown here is we are going to use uh, numbers to help us figure out the functions of different nerves. So um, what I'll have you do is pick, if you have three colors, um, go ahead and pick three colors. So I'm going to pick, I'm going to pick red. I'm going to pick blue and I'm going to pick green. These colors are going to go along with, with the types of nerves that we're talking about um, to give me an idea kind of of their function. So for me, my red nerves are always going to be my sensory nerves. I should make that black writing there. All of my red nerves are going to be a nerve that has a sensory function. All of my blue nerves are going to be a nerve that has a motor function. And then um, the rest of my nerves that are green are going to be what we call mixed. So let me actually, well, I'll put, I'll put mixed here, um, and we'll say that it's both, sensory and motor. Uh, with our cranial nerves, there is a phrase that you can use to, to memorize if they're a sensory nerve, a motor nerve, or a mixed nerve, or sometimes called a both nerve. Um, so the phrase I like to use for my nerves uh, to know if it's sensory, motor, or mixed is some say marry money but my brother says big business makes money. It's a random kind of meaningless phrase, but what it's gonna show me is when I go through and start, start adding nerves to my face here, the first letter of these words tell me is it a sensory nerve? Is it a motor nerve or is it both? Does it do sensory functions? Does it do motor functions or does it do both? So I'm gonna use this phrase to help me to color code my nerves basically. So my first two nerves, as we can see on, on our phrase here, some say, my first two nerves are sensory nerves. So for my clown, I'm gonna take my red pen here. The number one, cranial nerve number one, is already drawn here for me. I'm gonna put a little circle around cranial nerve number one that's red, which is fitting, right, for clown nose. Cranial nerve number one is the olfactory nerve. So the olfactory nerve, we've got a number one in the face, the middle of the face of our clown, perfect. Cranial nerve number one, a sensory nerve that helps me with the sense of smell. Cranial nerve number two is also a sensory nerve. So those two little eyes that you made, I told you they're gonna be creepy, right? Those eyes on my clown are red. So we just upped the creepy factor a whole bunch here. Cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve that helps me with smell. Cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve that helps me to see. Now we're going to move to cranial nerve number three that was called the oculomotor nerve. Who remembers for me what oculomotor did? Oculo motor the two parts of its name exactly eye movement moves the eyes okay so since we're moving something and since my my phrase told me right here that it's it's a motor nerve i'm going to switch colors now i'm going to go to my motor color so i'm going to do uh blue now oculomotor cranial nerve number three we're going to add a number three up here like eyelashes number three because cranial nerve number three, if we were getting really specific, the way that it moves the eyeball is that it controls a muscle that lives on top of the eyeball. Cranial nerve number three up here. So cranial nerve number three helps to move the eyeball. Remember I told you though to remember that three, four, and six. Let me make a note of that over here. Three, four, and six. All of these nerves have the same function. They move the eye. So three, four, and six, we'll go ahead and add them all around the same time. We added number three, it controls a muscle on the top of the eyeball. Number four controls a muscle that's on the, the kind of attached at an angle on the top of the eyeball. Number six controls a muscle that's on the lateral side of the eyeball. Our clown has some really creepy eyelashes going on here. So cranial nerves number three, four and six. All three of these nerves help me to move the eyeball. Cranial nerve number two is the only one that helps me to see. So please 
make sure we know the difference. Number two is the sight one. Three, four, and six are, are the ones that, that move the eyeball. We skipped number five. Cranial nerve number five is the trigeminal nerve. That's the biggest nerve. And if you go back to our phrase here, this is also our first mixed nerve, or our first both nerve. It has sensory and motor functions. So I'm going to switch colors here, and I am going to add a number five. Sorry, I, uh, this is the one day I didn't put my phone on Do Not Disturb. It's going to be the one day I get like five million texts. Okay, cranial nerve number five is the trigeminal nerve. Remember, that's the one that we made our number three, our sideways number three, and branched it on our face, right? That was the trigeminal nerve. So make yourself a big number five at the edges of where the clown's smile would be, cranial nerve number five. The trigeminal nerve goes to all over on the sides of the face and up into the different places of the face. So we made a big number five for the trigeminal nerve that's out there. We already did number six, the abducens nerve that attaches to the side muscles. Now we're on to cranial nerve number seven. Cranial nerve number seven is the facial nerve. The facial nerve is another both nerve. So we've got another mixed nerve that does sensory motor things. The facial nerve, based on its name, also goes to the face. So put in the little quarters of your number five. We're going to add a little seven. The seven goes to some of the similar places. The facial nerve goes to similar places as the trigeminal. It's just not quite as big. So cranial nerve number five and number seven, they're pretty similar to each other. They're both there about, about the face. Cranial nerve number eight was the vestibulocochlear nerve. That was my, my last, uh, somebody says my five didn't show up. Is that, um, is everyone saying that? Or I, I should have two fives and two sevens. I see it. Yeah. So, um, maybe refresh Kathleen, um, gotta love blackboard collaborate, right? It's, uh, giving us issues. So just refresh and come back in. I promise the, the other ones will show up. Cranial nerve number eight was our last, uh, sensory only nerve. So cranial nerve number eight was the one that goes to the ears. Let's add some sensory colored ears. Sensory colored ears, number eight, right there. Helps me out with hearing, the sense of hearing. Cranial nerve number nine is my uh, glossopharyngeal nerve. So cranial nerve number nine is another example of a mixed nerve. We're back to my mixed color here because it's, it's green. Cranial nerve number nine. Our clown just got real creepy because his mouth is a number nine. Number nine helps us out with taste. It helps us out with moving the tongue. Uh, so we're putting it in the mouth region for my clown friend here. Cranial nerve number nine. Cranial nerve number 10 is called the vagus nerve. Uh, the word vagus literally means wandering. This nerve goes all over the place. So running down like buttons on my clown's shirt, add some number 10s for the vagus nerve. And if you look at your description of the vagus nerve, it goes all over the place, the vagus nerve. So we're going to make little vagus nerve buttons, number 10 buttons that go down on this clown. We already put number 11 on, on our picture here. Number 11 is a motor nerve. So get your motor color and we're going to color in the bow tie on our clown here. The accessory nerve is a motor nerve. So for me, that's blue color. The accessory nerve, the best way to remember what it does is it controls the muscles that are in the place that you would wear an accessory, like a scarf or a necklace. So the accessory nerve controls the sternocleidomastoid muscle in the neck and also the trapezius muscle in the back. So um, the accessory nerve is a motor nerve that controls those things. And then our last nerve is also a motor nerve, the hypoglossal. That part glossal, we had two nerves that had glosso in them. Uh, glossal means the tongue. So hypoglossal means, if I could spell it, glossal means below the tongue. 
Number nine was glossopharyngeal. Glossopharyngeal means tongue, throat. Okay, so cranial nerve number 12, hypoglossal. In the middle of your number nine, add a little 12 in there. That was a bad 12. Little 12 inside the mouth where I'd find the tongue, the hypoglossal nerve. It controls the movement of the tongue. This may or may not help you. If you don't feel like this is going to help you with your studying, ignore it. Pretend we didn't talk about it. If you feel like having a visual representation of what these different cranial nerves do would help you, then please, by all means, study this. So it gives you an idea of, of generally where in the face and the head or in the body, in the case of the vagus nerve, where things go. And it gives you a general idea of which ones am I learning a motor function on, all the ones that I have in blue on mine, um, which one are doing just a sensory function that I have in red, or which ones do sensory stuff and motor stuff. So a, a couple of different things we can learn from, from our creepy clown face here. So maybe that'll start haunting you in your dreams, and that's how you'll know it's all over, right? That, that anat you have anatomy dreams about the creepy clown. Um, that, that's about where we're at in the semester, right? Creepy clown dreams with, with anatomy clowns. Uh, here's one other thing um, that you can use to help you with the names of the cranial nerves to get them in order. Um, just like we have our phrase about marrying money or marrying someone whose family does business and they make money, um, here's a phrase for us to help us memorize the order of the cranial nerves. Although, alas, it's not quite as, as applicable in the current um, quarantine situation. Here's my favorite. O wants one takes the anatomy final very good vacations are happening. If only. I really wish there'd be a very good vacation at the end of this, right? No, actually, my vacation is going to be when I go to the hospital and have my baby, right? So there's my vacation that I'm planning for May. Um, but, but this phrase right here helps us to know the first letter of the names of each of our cranial nerves. So olfactory, number one, optic, number two, oculomotor, number three, trochlear, trigeminal abducens, Facial, vestibulocochlear, glossopharyngeal, uh, vagus, accessory, and hypoglossal. You can do a Google search and you'll come up with a whole bunch of other ones too, if this one's just too depressing in our, our current day and age, right, where there is no vacationing. Um, but whatever phrase will help you to remember what order they go in and whatever way you want to learn their functions with the clown face or with something else. Please feel free to, to do whatever, whatever works for you. All right, give me a thumbs up, a flash mob dance party, or give me some questions that, that you might have. Letty says the phrases help. Good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So um, I will keep giving you any phrases that I got for you. Mention 10 one more time. 10 is called the vagus nerve. That's this one over here, the vagus nerve. Its name means wandering. Um, so this one literally wanders all over your thoracic cavity. It goes way down into the, into the chest cavity. It does a whole lot with your organs. Um, so that's why we draw it going down because it interacts with stuff down lower on the body. So cranial nerve number 10, that wandering one that goes everywhere. Yep. All right. Well, uh, if you have more questions, feel free to, to pose them, and either I'll answer them today or tomorrow during office hours is, is the weekly review thing. So if you, you want to bring some back with you uh, tomorrow, we can talk more lab stuff tomorrow. I want to briefly touch on sheep brain um, because a couple of us especially were interested in cranial nerves on the sheep brain. So let me pull up my picture. Um, yeah, so someone was mentioning hitting that vagus nerve and stopping breathing. Yes, um, the, the, the vagus nerve is um, interesting. 
the, the vagus nerve does control breathing rate, definitely. Um, and it, it goes all over the place. So having a surgery somewhere else in the body can definitely bump into the vagus nerve. That's, that's not great for us. Okay. Here is um, some of the pictures that you have in the lab manual of the sheep brain. What I will tell you with the sheep brain is I know there are great videos that we posted for you in the guided lesson showing uh, instructors going through and pointing out each of these structures. So please take the time to watch the videos. I know sometimes you're like, whatever, I can find stuff. I don't need videos. This would be a good one for you to, to watch those videos on. Pretend that you're in real life with that instructor. Pretend you get to touch the sheep brain. Um, it is really sad, like we were saying at the beginning of class today, that we didn't get to do the sheep brain together. Um, the big thing I'm going to point out on here, because it's what we specifically asked about, were the cranial nerves. So there are really just three cranial nerves that you need to know on the sheep brain, and I promise they're, they're very noticeable. First cranial nerve, cranial nerve number one, uh, help me out because I forgot it. What's the name of cranial nerve number one? I'm going to make you type. Cranial nerve number one. <coughs> okay, well, we agree it starts with O. Uh, we are divided whether it is the optic nerve or the olfactory nerve. Cranial nerve number one, yeah, Letty's saying it's our, it's my smell nerve. Yes, cranial nerve number one is the smell nerve. Um, so that is going to be the, uh, the olfactory nerve. Yeah, as, as Kathleen's chiming in, cranial nerve number two is the optic nerve. So remember that clown face, he's got a number one for his nose. When I look at my sheep brain here, see this, this structure that extends up here in the front and this structure that extends up here in the front right here? These are my two cranial nerve number ones right there, the olfactory nerve. I can see them there. I told you, yes, and, you, and I told you for cranial nerve number two that we're looking for the X, right, to help us find number two. And on this sheep brain, I can see that X really clearly. So I've got this middle part right here. Remember that X part? We said that part was called the optic chiasm. The optic chiasm. So this crisscross right here where we make the X, that's in cranial nerve number two. So cranial nerve number two is the big X that I see right here. Cranial nerve number three was down below. Uh, I just typed optic chiasm, Gary. That's the only thing I typed at the top. Um, down below, I can see cranial nerve number three. That's this big one right here. So the only other cranial nerve we have to know is the one that's next in line down below that X. That's cranial nerve number three down there. If we squint here, let me zoom in a little bit just to show you. If we zoom in close and we squint a little bit, you can see number six right here. But it's not clear enough for me to ask you to label it on the picture. And it's not clear enough for me to ask that on, on the exam. So the only cranial nerves we need to know on the sheep brain are the ones that we started with. Number one, olfactory in the front. Number two, optic that I see with the crisscross. Number three, oculomotor, the, those two that I see that are underneath the X. Those are the only cranial nerves that we need to know. As your guided lesson tells you, the sheep brain does not look 100% like the human brain but it's very similar. So please, as you're working on labeling the stuff in the sheep brain, please make sure to reference back to last week's packet because the, the same general places you found stuff are gonna be the places that you find it on the sheep brain as well. I do want to point out on two, it is next to the, it, it is the X. Um, so so it, it is the X, the entire thing is cranial nerve number two, yeah. Uh, Pilar asked if we need to know the names. Yes, you learned the names on the previous page. So, yes, we do need to know the names of them. We just, for the sake of simplicity, for all the stuff you had to label on that page, we didn't have you write out the entire name of the nerve. But, yes, do you know the names of the nerves? Because that's part of, of this lab, is learning those names. I want to point out one structure that I feel like the videos did not do a good job uh, of showing you what it was. Um, just to mention it, 
The structure that I want to point out is this big bump that you see right here. This big bump right here. This big bump that I see right here is called the corpora quadragemina. The corpora quadragemina. Literally what this name corpora quadragemina means is four bodies um, or four bumps, if you will. The corpora quadragemina, if you remember from last week when we were studying the brain structures, they're attached to the midbrain. And really, that's all we knew about the midbrain is that it had these corpora quadrigemina. The job of the corpora quadrigemina is reflexes. So it's visual reflexes and it's auditory reflexes. In the human brain, the corpora quadrigemina is nearly this big. It's really big in sheep. But the joke I always like to say in class is like, think about a sheep's life, right? There's not a lot that they do but they do need to stay alive. So they're really good at seeing things around them and, and getting away from a wolf, trying to get away from a wolf. They're really good at getting scared by loud noises. So the corpora quadrigemina, the reflex centers for, for visual things and hearing things, really, really big in a sheep. In the human brain, they're not nearly this big. So I was really sad that my videos didn't do a good job saying that, um, this big bump that I see back here is the corpora quadrigemina. Other than that, I think that you can find um, those other structures. So I want to make sure we have plenty of time for, for joints and muscle actions and stuff. But be thinking if, if there's some things on this picture that, that gave you some trouble, save those for the end. If I have a little extra time, I'll come back to it. Or we can definitely talk about it more tomorrow. I just want to make sure we found these guys here, the corpora quadrigemina, because the videos, again, were not, were not great for that. Okay, so this week, we are learning about the arm, right? That's our focus here, the upper limb. Um, a, a quick terminology review for you. The part of your upper limb that includes the humerus, technically, that's the part that we call the arm. The part of your, your upper limb or your, in normal people words, arm, that has the radius and the only called the forearm. So when you're looking at actions, when we're, we're talking about parts of the body, you will see that we talk about moving the forearm. Um, that's the place where the radius and the ulna is. We are not talking about moving the humerus part, the, the upper part of the arm this week. That's going to come next week. That's going to be our, our last lab week is, is movements of the arm, the humerus. Um, so I know there's the great eScans website. Um, how many of you have had a chance to check out that website that's found in your, your guided lesson where you can look at those pictures of the bones in 3D? Did any of us take a time, the time to look at those, those websites? Yes, a couple of people, not yet. Um, what I'll say is they are really, really helpful because it shows the bones in 3D. These, these are really flat. So uh, we pull up. Let's see if I can. Yeah, it's really, Isabella, I agree. Let me see if I can find it really fast. These skeletons. Let me just show you. I'm going to pull up the humerus here for you and show you what this website does. All right, I'm going to share a different screen here. I know, I'm a bone lover. It is, it is true. I, I will take that. But check this out, guys. It's, like, super cool. Okay, here I am on that website, and you've got a link directly to this in the, in the guided learning activity. This is a humerus right here. Okay, so I look at the humerus. I'm looking at it right now from the anterior view, from the front side. I could look at it from the lateral view when I look at it from, from the side. I could look at it from the back view, the posterior view. Let's go here back to the front, though. When I look at this uh, on the front side of the body, if I click this morphology button right here, all those bone markings that I need to be able to label when I am I'm labeling my packet, they're all right here. And it shows you exactly where they are. And maybe I don't want to just be able to find them on the front view. Maybe I need to go to the back side of the humerus. I want to find it back there. I go to the back side. I click morphology. And look, those bone markings are there again. So that e-skeleton page, please check it out because it's super cool. Um, you can rotate the bone in 3D. So here it's going to, let's see if it'll load for me. Got a lot going on on my computer. So there we go. 
This is rotating the bone for me in 3D. This does not have labels, but if, for example, you were really interested, let me make it stop rotating. Maybe I'm really interested in seeing the bone markings at the very top of, um, let me see, remind myself how to zoom, rotate, zoom is Z, right? Mouse, zooms. I haven't played with it quite enough. Right mouse, oh, there we go, okay, here we go. I am really interested in seeing what's going on at the top. I did a bad job, I zoomed in the wrong place. But I can see my, my bone markings that are up here when I zoom in close. So play with this website a little bit. Um, definitely, definitely take advantage of it. If nothing else, even if we don't play with this 3D model right here, look at the front side, look at the back side. Again, when you click morphology, there's all those bone markings you're trying to label. So that eSkeleton website, a really good reference for you. Check that one out to help you with, uh, with labeling your bone markings. Peek back at my chat. Yeah, so I do, I do, I do like my, uh, like my, my bones. That is correct. So uh, check out that eSkeleton site. Let me go back to though. Screen's gonna disappear. Let me get my file back. We wanted to talk about joints. We wanted to talk about actions. So let me zoom down in our packet here. Start with the joints. When we talk about joints, it really comes back to the same ideas that we talked about in, in previous weeks with joints. The name of a joint is going to tell me what bones or what bones are there. So I've got this beginning part right here on this one that says carpo. What bones, if the name of this joint starts with carpo, what kind of bones am I expecting to find there? Yeah, the carpal bones, exactly. Carpo is gonna be somewhere near the carpals. Now this is the carpo metacarpal joint. Remember in your hands that we had three types of bones. We had the carpals that were part of the wrist. We had the metacarpals that made up the palm of the hands. And then we had the phalanges that make up the bones of the fingers. I have joints or places where each of those types of bones meet with each other. So the place where the carpal bones, the wrist bones, meet the metacarpal bones, which are the palm bones, the ones in the palm of your hand, that's called the carpo-metacarpal joint. The place where the metacarpals, that metacarpal word right there, meets the phalanges, the fingers, that's, that's at my first round of knuckles right here, that would be called the metacarpophalangeal joint. So when we're looking at the names of these joints, I promise it just comes from, you, you can figure out where they are with the bone names there. Um, the only thing that maybe might throw us off just a little bit is if you check out, we've got proximal and distal. I've got two radio ulnar joints. Hey, not a question. There's two bones at a radio ulnar joint. What are the two bones at a radio ulnar joint? Two bones there. Who lives at these joints? Yeah, so Leslie's chiming in for me. First half of my name looks like radius. Second half of my name looks like ulna. The radio ulnar joints are the two joints uh, that I find between the radius and the ulna. There are two places that the radius and the ulna meet with each other. They meet here on, above the wrist. So here's one radio ulnar joint. And they meet up here by the elbow as well. That's where my other radio ulnar joint would be. The difference between these two joints is distal and this proximal word. Yes, yeah, so Eileen is proposing that the distal radio ulnar joint is the one by the wrist. What do we think? Let me put that to the class. Distal radio ulnar joint. Do we think that one's the one by the wrist? Yes, that is correct. The distal one is the one by the wrist. Remember that distal means it's farther from the attachment point. So the distal radio ulnar joint is the one down here by your wrist where the radius and the ulna meet. And the proximal one is up here at the elbow where the radius and the ulna meet up here by the elbow. 
there's not much else I can say about, about those joints um, other than to tell you guys, honestly, don't memorize the technical descriptions of each of these joints here because I promise you if you look at their names and you use your critical thinking skills, the names of those bones, I promise you that you'll be able to answer these questions. So what I want you to do with this activity, do go through and look at it. Do match up the names of the joints with each of these descriptions, but do not memorize um, the, the descriptions of what these joints are. Get an idea of where they are in the body and use their name to help you figure out where they are in the body. Um, when it comes to the bone markings and the bones, what I will tell you with a couple of these is that there's not bone markings in particular at the joint. Um, at the wrist joint, for example, there's not a lot of specific bone markings that make up your wrist, but there are a bunch of specific bones. And we are learning the names of those bones, right? We're learning the wrist bones. Um, again, at the knuckle joints, there's not specific bone markings up here, but there are specific bone names that are found there. So for these two, you're not going to have bone markings. You'll have bone names for the, the types of things found at those joints. Uh, do we want me to talk about the carpal bones or did we feel okay about those based on the learning activity? Thumbs up or do we want to talk about the carpals, the bones of the wrist? Because I can go either way. Help me help you. Okay. I don't know if, if you're yes, Pilar, you want to talk about them or you feel good about them. How about let's do it this way. If you want to talk about them, can you raise your hand for me? We're probably about 50-50, it looks like, in the chat. Okay, yeah, I've, I've got about a, at least half of us that would like to talk about them. So we'll talk about it really fast. We go up to the carpals. The carpals have specific names. Um, so we need to be able to identify each of the carpals based on their name. Again, by the way, this is when that e-skeleton thing is super helpful because you can zoom in and, and look at, at these carpal bones. So um, the, the carpal bones, here's the phrase that, that you have in the guided learning activity for learning the names of these bones. The phrase is, Sally left the party to take Cindy, Cindy home. Hey, did anyone see the little joke that I left for you guys in the guided lesson about this? Did anyone see my little joke for you? Yes, okay, a couple of us did. I, I write these guided lessons, by the way, guys, so uh, I like to throw in a little bit of humor there. So um, the, the joke is that Sally left a party to take Cindy home, except we can't have parties right now. So this must have been, been pre-quarantine days. So... Uh, Sally left the party to take Cindy home. That's that's our, our mnemonic or our phrase to help us out with the names of, of these bones. Here's those bones listed in that order. So scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. That's the names of the bones that go with that. When you're naming the bones, you're always going to start on the medial side. We're always going to start on the thumb side work our way laterally. We're also starting in the proximal row, that's the row by the wrist. Then we bump up to the distal row, the one that's closer to the hands. So when we start in the middle, the first bone is the scaphoid bone. We move over to the lunate next door. The triquetrum uh, is a bone that is attached to the pisiform. And what I'll have all of you guys do, if we were in class together, we do this. Take your hand and bend it all the way backwards. So bend your hand all the way backwards and then feel on the edge of your wrist. We're not down in the radius and the ulna down here. We're down here on the edge of the wrist. There's a little bump where there's a bone that sticks out. That little bone that sticks out is the pisiform bone or the party bone there. So the pisiform bone is the one that sticks out when you bend your wrist backwards. The pisiform bone can only be seen when I'm looking at the anterior or the front side of the hand because the pisiform bone is on top of the triquetrum. It hurts when you put your wrist like that. Well, don't bend it too far then, <laughs> don't wanna hurt you. Um, but I'll give you a, a frame of reference where you can feel your pisiform bone there. 
so we've got the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, and the little pisiform that sticks out by the pinky. Then we go back over to the thumb side. We have the trapezium and the trapezoid. Here's my wink, wink, nudge, nudge for you. They are in alphabetical order. That's the only way I remember them, only way I keep them straight. Trapezium comes before trapezoid. So the trapezium is the one that's directly next to the thumb. The trapezoid is the one next to it. Then we have the capitate and the hamate. So the, the eight bones of the carpals or the bones there of the wrist, you can do the same thing when we're on the back side. We still would start in the middle and work our way over. But remember, we're skipping the party. I guess the back side of the hand, that's the, the quarantine acceptable version um, uh, of life. So we've got the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, no party bone, no pisiform over here. Then we go back over, trapezium and trapezoid. So the trapezium is really small up top. Yeah, party of one, right? That sounds about right. Trapezium up attached to the thumb, the trapezoid next to it, and then the capitate and the hamate. So use that phrase or find yourself another phrase on the internet, whatever's going to help you get those bones in order. Uh, we, we, our phrases go from the thumb side to the pinky side, from distal to prox, or sorry, excuse me, from proximal row to distal row, the, the, the carpal bones there. All right, I want to make sure we have enough time for actions and origins and insertions. So I'm going to bump straight to that. Help me out here. Um, what page do the actions start on, on your lab packet? Where do my actions start? I'm pulling up another website here. Looks like we're agreeing we're on page 13. Okay, so page 13 of, of the packet. That's perfect. Let me pull up something for us to reference here in a minute. Let's do, we'll do this. Okay. When we talked about this a couple weeks ago, when we were working on the legs, I told you guys to not memorize specific things. I told you to memorize general rules. And that advice still stands. So on page 13 in your lab packet, underline, highlight, star, my first rule here. My first rule is the muscles that live on the anterior side, the front side of the arm, are going to be muscles that flex the radius and the ulna. And we want to underline, highlight, star that muscles that live on the posterior side, the back side, are the ones that extend the radius and the ulna. If we know where muscles live and what they do, we can predict these actions and we do not have to memorize them. Again, with, with all that you have to learn and memorize, those bone markings, we have to memorize them. We can't think our way through those. We can think our way through muscle actions, so please do. So when we're looking at the muscles we need to predict actions on here, all I really need to know to predict their action is if they live on the front side or the back side. So let's do this together. Hopefully, hopefully many of us have had a chance to um, look over our muscles here. The biceps brachii muscle, does that live on the front or the back of your arm? Biceps brachii. Where's your biceps? Front side or back side? Yes. Um, several of us are chiming in. That's one that lives on the front side. Front side or my technical anatomy word, because that's what we have it up here, right, is our anatomy word. Anterior means front. Posterior means back. So the posterior side is that back side of the arm. So we're going to say that the biceps brachii is a muscle that lives on the front side. Should have typed it. Do we know where brachioradialis lives? Where's brachioradialis? Any idea? Is that one front or back? We're a little bit less familiar with that one. Brachioradialis. Let's go back to muscle man here. I think he's my previous slide. Okay, brachioradialis is a muscle that, oh, I wish I had a better picture. Is these my only two? Okay, uh, brachioradialis in, in my picture right here 
is this one that attaches to the side of the arm and goes down to the front of the arm. Let's consult my friend the Google to find a better picture. Brachioradialis. Give me a minute. I'll get you a good one and then I'll share that screen with you. Okay, is that big? That's big enough. Okay, let me switch screens so you can see what I'm looking at. I do love my friend the Google here, so let's share uh, brachioradialis. Here we go. Here's this muscle by itself. It attaches to the lateral side of the humerus and extends down toward the front side of the arm, brachioradialis. Um, if I see it in the context of, let's see how big this is. See the context of the whole arm, all the muscles of the arm. Here's the thumb and then all of your, your palm uh, tendons inside here were on the front side of the arm. So it, it is, as Kathleen said, it is a very lateral muscle. It attaches laterally kind of up on the top, uh, but it is on the front side. It's not on the back side of the arm. So brachioradialis, a muscle there on the side. When I'm looking at the pictures in your lab manual, let me go back to our picture here. I swear there's got to be a better way to uh, to do this. Blackboard is always so clunky. Here we go. The picture that we're looking at, again, brachioradialis. There's a couple of places that I could label it. Um, yeah, so Carrie asked if the one that's that's pointing up is a better view. I was going to say that, yep, here's, here's one place I could label it right here. The other place that I can label it is right here. Right, let me, uh, actually, no, I, I lied. Let's see. I really don't like either of those pictures for brachioradialis because that makes it makes it look like it's on the, the back side. Arm pointing up. Yeah, so I don't like our pictures. It's official. Let me, because um, where is this palm? It would actually be, let me let me erase my writing. Somebody said they can't see it anyway. So here we go. I'm erasing it anyway. You're you're correct, Kathleen. I, I was I was throwing you guys, I was leading you guys astray. We can barely see it. It's this little guy right here. Brachioradialis. Um, let me zoom in to show you. This little tiny guy that's starting here on the side and reaches around to the front where we can't see. Um, so we're we're attaching a little bit over here. Um yeah, I'm going to be fully honest with you. I'm not going to use either of these pictures to flag the brachioradialis because it's really sad. So when you're studying brachioradialis, use Google images um, because we didn't do a good job taking pictures. I'm going to make a note of that actually in the lab book. we got to find a, a better view to see brachioradialis on. Um, short, long, long journey short there to say um, – Brachioradialis is on the front side. Um, I'm going to circle that one because we got to work on that one. This is where you can appreciate sheep, right? Yeah, they got the right idea, man. Just like, don't die. That that sounds good right about now. Like, that's my life motto right about now. Don't die. Okay, so brachioradialis is an anterior muscle. All of that to say, all that mess, sorry, to say we got an anterior muscle here with biceps. We have an anterior muscle here with brachioradialis. And the triceps muscle, is that one anterior or posterior? The triceps muscle. That's my posterior one. Yep, posterior. Okay, so two muscles live on the front side of the arm. One muscle lives on the back. We were memorizing not the specific actions of, of these muscles, we were memorizing the general rule. Well, I found biceps brachii on the anterior side of the arm. Because it's on the anterior side of the arm, it's a flexor. So my correct answer for what it does, this is a flexor. I find brachioradialis on the anterior side, even though my pictures are terrible, right? I find it on the anterior side. That means it's another flexor for me. I find triceps on the posterior side. That means it's another, it's an extensor for me. That's my one extensor. And these movements 
flexing the radius and the ulna and extending the radius and the ulna, these are ones that you totally can act out at home. So I've got my arm flat here. When I pull my arm up, when I bring the radius and the ulna toward my humerus, the angle got smaller. This is flexion. When I bring it back down, this is extension. So extension when the distance gets farther between them. So muscles that live on the front side, the anterior side of the arm, they're going to be my flexors. They're going to pull together the radius and the ulna with the humerus. Muscles that live on the back side are going to pull it back down, extend it back down. There's flexion and extension of the radius and the ulna. Then we go into the wrist joint. And good news for you, if we talk about flexion of the wrist joint, it's still muscles that live on the front side of the arm. When we talk about extension of the wrist joint, it's still muscles on the back side. So here's a general rule for you to just learn in general on the arm. If you live on the front, you're a flexor. If you live on the back, you're an extensor. That is only true for the arm, right? Because things got a little bit dicey in the leg when we talked about moving the tibia and the fibula. So keep in mind, this is a rule just for the arm, for the upper extremity. The other thing that's nice about, th about my muscles that move things at the wrist joint, look at these names right here. Even if you don't know if they live on the front side or the back side of the arm, I really hope you can use their name to figure out what they do, right? If part of my name says I'm an extensor, what do I do? If my name says I'm an extensor, what action do I do? Yeah, Eileen's one right. If I'm an extensor, I extend. Yeah, like it literally tells me what I do, right? So please don't tell me an extensor does flexion. Oh, please don't tell me that. Like I know we're tired, right? But we can't be that tired. So these two, even just based on their name, even if I don't know where they live, I can figure out that these two are extending the hand. I can figure out that these two down here are flexing the hand. What's more helpful for you maybe than, than these rules, since these ones are so straightforward here, what they do, these rules you can actually use backwards too. If you get to the exam, and I've got a picture for you of a muscle that's here on the anterior side of the hand, and you can't remember if this is the extensor carpi, uh, we'll go on the side radialis, or if it's the flexor carpi radialis, if you remember that my muscles that live on the front side are the flexors, you'll be able to pick the right answer. Or if I come to the exam and there's a muscle pinned on the back side of the forearm here, and I can't remember if it's the flexor or the extensor, if I know that the ones that live on the back do extension, that helps me know I'm looking for the extensor. So these first four, very straightforward because their name literally tells me what they do. This last one here, we do have to know a little bit about palmaris. Uh, yes, yeah, so Eileen is saying that palmaris flexes. That is the correct action. So if palmaris flexes, which side of the arm does palmaris live on? Yeah, Kathleen saw my question come in there. Palmaris lives on the anterior side. It lives on the front side. Palmaris longus, I know we can see. So uh, let me go back to our picture here of palmaris. Palmaris longus, see this big white tendon right here? That's your reference point. Palmaris longus is this muscle right here. As somebody said, it goes into the palm. That's how it got its name. So it goes into the palm. And so this big long tendon that you see, if I put a, a flag right here, if I put a little arrow that points to this one, well, that's a terrible arrow, right? Let's try again. We'll, uh, we'll make it black. And I'll, I'll try to get a better angle here. Let's say that I point directly at this one you see that this is the muscle that attaches to the tendon that goes into the palm. Perfect. That's palmaris longus. So that's going to be one of my, my flexors as well. So when we're talking about moving the wrist, use the names of the muscles as much as you can, because that's super easy. Or for this one muscle that its name doesn't tell me, just know that this one lives on the front, which means it's a flexor. When we talk about are um, muscles that live on the front side of the arm. 
The other thing that a couple of those muscles do, so flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris, um, the other thing that these ones do is they help me out with abduction and adduction. Remember that abduction and adduction, that has to do with how close you are to the middle of the body. So abduction means I'm pulling away from the middle of the body. Adduction means I'm going back toward the middle of the body. So again, we're memorizing our rules, right? We're not memorizing specific muscle actions. We're memorizing rules. So if you live on the lateral side, the outside of the forearm. So here, here's my forearm here. Well, let's see if I can get... I'm going to try to pull up my friend, the skeleton. I, I have a feeling this is not going to go well, but we're going to give it a try here. If I live on the lateral side of, I know, yeah. Um, if I live on the lateral side of, of the, the hand, when I contract this muscle, I'm pulling it laterally. I'm pulling the wrist laterally. Pulling it laterally is pulling it away from the middle of the body. So lateral muscles are, are going to pull are going to abduct the wrist medial muscles are going to adduct the wrist remember in adduction we go back toward the midline of the body uh carrie asked if we can use the names to help us with that yes so when it comes to predicting which of these flexors would do abduction versus adduction the way you're going to figure that out is which one of these is on the lateral side or on what would be the thumb side of the arm, and which of these is on the medial side, the pinky side. So help me out here, which of these two muscles, flexor carpi radialis or flexor carpi ulnaris, which of these is gonna be on the thumb side? Which one is closer to the, the lateral side or the thumb side of the arm? Yes. Radialis, that's going to be the one that's on the thumb side of the arm. And so if you live on the thumb side of the arm, that's the lateral side, that means that you are an abductor. Abductors live on the lateral side. If you live on the ulnaris side, on the pinky side, that's medial. Now we're medial, which means I adduct. I pull it back down. So absolutely, when you're thinking about um, especially about our flexors and extensors, figuring out where they live, you can totally use their names. Radialis and ulnaris, it, it really comes down to what bone they're on top of. So if you want to know lateral versus medial, just look at their names. Radialis versus ulnaris. And then I use those locations to help me out with the movements, either abduction and adduction, so moving the wrist toward the middle or away from the middle, um, or when, when we're talking about our other movements, flexion and extension. What questions do we still have about movements? Uh, Carrie asked, so that muscle has multiple actions. That is correct. Yes. And that's the same thing um, in the leg packet. We had muscles, remember, that moved both the femur and the tibia. Um, so yes, we would want to know both of the actions, have an idea of where a muscle lives and the kinds of things that it, that it could move, how it can move them. What other action questions do we have? Or give me a thumbs up if we're feeling okay about the action questions. Okay. Getting a lot of thumbs up. And again, the, the actions this week are ones that are really great for you to act out. So um, work on acting out these actions on yourself. And as you're acting out those actions, um, go ahead and remind yourself of the specific names of the muscles that, that you'd be using. The more we can connect things together, the more we're going to gonna remember stuff. Yeah, I'm getting my penguins. That's awesome. I guess that means we really understand, right? When I start getting penguins in the chat, that means we really got this stuff. So that's perfect. Yeah, flash mob with a penguin. Awesome. Okay, so the last thing in particular that you guys ask me to, to review is the origin and insertion activity. So um, we're going to go through and do this just like we've done in previous weeks. 
Remember with these origin insertion activities that it's a good idea to have multiple colors if you can. So I'm going to do my origin in blue. I'm going to do my insertion in green. And I'll draw my muscle in red. So my muscle is going to be red. I told you that what I think the best way is to do these activities is to um, start with finding your origin and your insertion. And once we've drawn, we found the origin and insertion, then we can do connect the dots. So um, I'm going to start off with my origin. That's blue. The muscle we are working on is brachioradialis, that one that was the bane of our existence, right? We couldn't figure out where it was because um, we didn't do a good job photographing him on Muscle Man. So we're going to draw him for ourselves here on, on our skeleton, and then we'll know for sure where it is. So uh, when we talk about the brachioradialis, the place that I find it is right by the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Remember, part of the goal of this activity is to help remind you about your bone markings. So the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, this lateral word, what does lateral mean? This is the lateral one. What does that mean? Yes, several of us, a couple of us are chiming in here. Lateral means that it, it's the one that's on the outside. It's away from the midline here. The humerus has two epicondyles. I'll point them out. I won't draw on them yet. The two epicondyles of the humerus are the two things that you feel. If you feel at your elbow joint, the parts that are connected to the humerus. So the up higher part, both of these are the later, or the, or the epicondyles. Excuse me. So help me out here. Number one, number two, which one is the lateral epicondyle? Number one, number two. Yeah, so multiple of us are trying in. It is number two is the one that's on the outside, the lateral one. Okay, so my origin, the place where this muscle starts, one of the places it starts is up here. Remind me, origins do or do not move. Origins do or do not move. Yeah, they do not move. Okay, so this is the place where brachioradialis attaches that when this muscle contracts, there's no movement here. This place stays stationary. It's not going anywhere. Okay, that's my first attachment site. My second attachment site is my insertion. My insertion is the styloid process of the radius. Remember, anytime you see this process word here, process always means something that sticks out. So the styloid process is on the radius. Let's go down here, and, and we're looking at our two bones down here. Number one, number two, which of these is the radius? Which bone is the radius, one or two? Yeah, now it's number two, number one, excuse me, yep. The styloid process of the radius, again, if you hold up your hand, the styloid process of the radius is the bony landmark that you feel before you get to your wrist bones. So we felt the pisiform, the little bone all the way on the, the lateral side. We're here more toward uh, the thumb. Well, excuse me, it's the lateral too. Sorry. So when we're here by the, the thumb, the bone marking I feel here before I get into my carpals, that bone marking down there is the styloid process of the radius. What bone lives over here on this side, by the way? What's this one over here? Who's this on the pinky side? Yeah, that's the, the the ulna is out here on the pinky side. The ulna has a styloid process as well. So my sticking out part at the bottom of, of the ulna, let me zoom in if we can see it. The one that sticks out off of the ulna is actually a lot more pronounced or a lot easier to see or feel, the styloid process of the ulna. But we are attached to the styloid process of the radius. So this little circle that I or this little bump that I see right here, that's going to be my insertion. The place where this muscle attaches, that does move, remember the insertion does move when the muscle contracts. Okay, I've drawn an origin, I've drawn an insertion. Now I do my connect the dots. Here's my muscle that again I find on the anterior side of the body. Now, with these questions, I, I've said this before and, and I'll say it again. 
the best way to help you with making these kinds of predictions is I really want you to feel these places on yourself. So we've labeled them on the skeleton. If you put your arm out next to you in anatomical position and you put your hand out on your lateral epicondyle, I know you can't see what I'm doing here, right? Because it's too low, but feel that lateral epicondyle on yourself. Feel that styloid process on your radius. When a muscle contracts, the insertion, the styloid process on the radius, moves toward the origin, the, the lateral epicondyle. When you move those together, the movement ends up looking like this. They're getting closer to each other than they were when they were straight out flat. We're bringing them into a closer vicinity. And when I bring them closer to each other, I'm doing this movement right here where my angle between the bones has gotten smaller. I have decreased the angle at this joint. So my answer for what it does is it decreases the angle. What's the anatomy movement word for I decrease the angle at a joint? What's the anatomy word for making that angle smaller at a joint? Exactly. Yep. Some of us are chiming in. That's flexion. So there are two ways to describe what a muscle does, right? We can use the anatomy word, which is what we used on the previous page, where we would say that it, it flexes the, the radius and the ulna. Or we can use the normal person word, where we say we decrease the angle or make things a little bit smaller. Make sure you can still describe what movement words mean. Because I might ask you on, on the exam, or I might ask you on the homework assignment, not whether it flexes or extends, because we already did those kinds of predictions. I might ask you to use these kinds of words here, increase or decrease the angle, or move it toward or move it away from the midline of the body. So make sure we can describe what those anatomy movement words mean. I am not gonna do the second one today if we want if we if we have, are still having problems with the second one tomorrow maybe we can cover that in in office hours tomorrow um that is i've gone through and hit on all the the topics that we had mentioned for today um what other questions do we still have today about about this lab packet what are some of the, the things that are still tripping us up we got a little bit of time left today. Or if you're feeling good, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. That that would be great for me to know too. What questions do we still have? Or are we a thumbs up as much as we can at this point? So the radius is lateral and not medial is the question that we're getting. Help me out, um, put that to the class. Radius is lateral and not medial? That's correct, yep. Because remember, we have to reference back to anatomical position. That's that really awkward position where you put your palms facing forward. When your palms face forward, that puts, uh, that puts the radius on the outside, the lateral side. So that is correct, the radius is lateral. Um, yeah, so, Eileen's asking forward as in up. Yes, so, so it, it, it ends up moving when we when we describe the way that it that it moves the radius and the ulna. Yes, they do kind of pull the radius and the ulna forward toward the front side of the body. Um, and, and that movement ends up pulling it up as well. Um, rather than having to describe the radius and the ulna move forward, which also pulls them up, I could just say, uh, to summarize it, either that that's action, which is my anatomy word for it, or like we talked about here on, on my page here, the other way to describe all of those things in one word or a few words is just it decreases the angle. It brings them closer together. So, yeah, they go forward as in up, as in flexion, as in decreasing the angle. Yeah, it's all kind of the same. Any other questions? While I wait for questions, I'll give you guys your daily penguin. Get you your daily penguin. I'm getting better at 
start drawing them because if you've noticed, like when I draw something, then it smooths out what I drew. So it looks like I'm getting way better than I actually am because it like smooths it out for me and makes it look nicer. Pilar is asking, flexion decreases the angle. Put that to us. Flexion, does that decrease the angle? Is that correct? That is correct. Yep. Flexion is when the angle gets smaller. Extension is when the angle gets bigger. Flexion, I bring bones together. Extension, I pull them apart. On the connective tissue above the metacarpals, let me go back, I missed part of that there. That's where the metacarpals meet the carpals. Um, yeah, so that, that's our attachment site for the next muscle that you're doing the origin insertion on, right, Carrie? Um, basically, just it, you don't have to be super precise with the location of it. Basically, it's just it's just above the metacarpals. So there's a bunch of connective tissue. The hands are filled with, there's connective tissue all over the place here in the palms. We have a couple muscles that go in between the metacarpals, but in general, there's just a whole lot of uh, connective tissue that's inside of here. Um, so any, as long as you're on top of the metacarpals and not out here on the phalanges and not down here on the carpals, you're you're in the right enough region. That that's that's perfect. Um, so Lexi asked you if we can do the next insertion. I'm going to save the next insertion for tomorrow. I do want you to try to. Uh, Try to work on it on your own. See, I, I know there might be some confusing parts about it. See if you can um, see if you can work on it tonight, and we will plan to work on that toward the end of office hours tomorrow. I want to give you a chance to kind of practice with it and play with it. Yeah, not only is my penguin getting prettier each day, right? Today it got even bigger. I gave it its own whiteboard today, so today it got really big. That my big penguin. Yeah, so Lexi, bring bring that question back tomorrow. Try to work on it tonight, um, but bring it back tomorrow if, if you're still having trouble with it. Okay, well, I'm about done with content for the day. So what I want to pop up for you really fast as my computer spins in circles over here. How many of us are planning on taking the exam today? Anybody who planning to take it today? Carrie already did. Awesome. Wow, lots of people already did. Okay. Well, maybe maybe it's going to be okay that my computer won't. Uh, oh, I was going to open up my little files here um, to show you my my slides from yesterday, my encouraging slides for you. My my penguin's just going to have to do today. Um, my, my penguin is saying to you guys, for any of you that are taking it today or tomorrow, you got this. I believe in you. I have a nice little meme that shows that, but of course, Blackboard is like, no, we're not, we're not going to share. So, um, penguin is, is rooting for you. Anyone who's taking it today or tomorrow, um, please make sure to give yourself a distraction free environment. Remember, we can't use any resources, but you are allowed to have a piece of scratch paper. So if there's answer choices you want to um, cross off mentally, we can't do it on the screen, right? So if you want to make notes for yourself, you're welcome to use that. But again, no, no other resources for that. Um, somebody asked if, does the skeleton, or do, do you have a penguin skeleton shirt? I do not. Um, that's, that's actually very intriguing. I might need to look into that. Um, I have the pregnant belly skeleton shirt, right? So, um, and I have my, my daughter and I just love to be twins. So I, once I'm not pregnant anymore, I'm going to have to get a new skeleton shirt so that we can be twins. So maybe I'll have to get us penguin skeleton shirts because that would be awesome. That'd be pretty rocking. You're welcome, Letty. You're welcome, Leslie. Um, I'll stick around for a few more minutes here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop that recording. But yeah, good luck to anyone taking that exam today. And if you still have questions, um, tomorrow's a free-for-all, so bring those questions to, to tomorrow's session.